ಸಹನಾವತಿ ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿಧ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಅಖಂಡಮಂಡಲಾಕಾರ ವ್ಯಾಪ್ತ ಯೇನ ಚರಾಚರ ತತ್ಪದ ದರ್ಶಿ ಯೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಅಜ್ಞಾನತಿರಾಂಧಸ್ಯ ಜ್ಞಾನಾಂಜನಶಲಾಕಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರನ್ ಮೀಲಿತ ಯೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಗುರುರ್ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಗುರುರ್ವಿಷ್ಣು ಗುರುರ್ದೇವೋ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರ ಗುರುರೇವ ಪರಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಸ್ಥಾವರ ಜಂಗಮ ವ್ಯಾಪ್ತ ಯತ್ಕಿಂಚಿತ್ ಸಚರಾಚರ ತತ್ಪದ ದರ್ಶಿ ಯೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ವ್ಯಾಪಿ ಯತ್ಸರ್ವ ತ್ರೈಲೋಕ್ಯ ಸಚರಾಚರ ತತ್ಪದ ದರ್ಶಿ ಯೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಮೇವ ಬಂಧುಶ್ಚ ಸಖಾತ್ವೇವ ವಿದ್ಯಾವಿಣೇವ ಸರ್ವ ಮಮ ದೇವೇವ ಸರ್ವ ಮಮ ದೇವೇವ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಅನಗ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ಐಮ್ ಶೋರ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಸ್ ಆರ್ very eager after a very long time that we have uh, this is finally happening after a lot of uh, manifestation if i have to put it in the air quotes <laughs> but uh, so we are finally here i think i'll not waste any more time uh, we're all very eager to hear swami ji so all right but right so all of you are from the chinmay yoga kendra class in bengaluru i'm very happy to be here with all of you some of you i met in the national convention at in my vibhuti we have been wanting to have this satsang and then faqs and many topics so finally we have hindu culture and now we are on karma <laughs> so is karma that we have landed up with karma so tell me how many of you believe that this session is happening and you are attending by choice that you have chosen to attend this you can answer in the chat or you can raise your hand whichever way you like you have chosen to attend okay very good three of them others are here by force <laughs> so some another question is do you believe that you are destined to attend this one person says i am destined to attend so it's not a choice you are destined to attend and somebody decided your destiny and how many of you believe that your choice was destined three different questions either you chose to be here or you were destined to be here or your choice also is destined <laughs> you think many times we think like this about life different aspects sometimes we think it is all our choice sometimes we think no no it is destined and especially when success comes then it is my choice i achieved it because of my choice my efforts when difficulties come 
disappointments come, then some God is sitting there, why is he doing this to me? So, different thoughts are there about karma. All the three questions based are on basis of karma. So, first we have to understand what is karma. I am going to take a half a minute and move my position here because I am in Sidbari, there was no current here. So, I was facing one bulb which was having light on generator. Now the other lights have come on, so give me half a minute. Ah, now this is better. All right, so Puja Gurudev used to say that Action is the very signature of life. Every moment of our life is an expression of action. We are born <laughs> because of karma. And we are here to exhaust certain karma also. So, this world, this earth, Bhuloka, is called Karma Yoni. If a person is born on this earth as a human being, that human yoni is called karma yoni. And this bhu loka is meant for the human being to exhaust karma. In no other birth can one consciously choose and speed up evolution. Only in human birth one can do that. In other births one can exhaust karmas, but one can't speed up evolution. That's why they are called bhoga yonis. This Manusha Yoni is called Karma Yoni. So what exactly is Karma? I am going to share some points I made and uh, you can also interact on this. We will keep it as an interactive session where you will also answer a few things. So let us see. So we perform countless actions every day. So what exactly is karma? So now you have to answer. Can any movement be called karma? Yes or no? What is the definition of action called karma? Like I don't. Know. Sorry. An action. Any action that you do is. Any action you do is karma. All right, that I understand. My question here is specific. Any movement is it called karma? In physics, the definition of work you will see. Na? So can any movement be called karma? I am moving my hand. Is it karma? I think it should be conscious movement. Okay, so it should be conscious movement. That is karma. All right, let's see. If I sit and think, I'm not doing any movement. I'm only thinking. Is it karma? Yes. Earlier he said action is karma. This is no action. I'm doing thinking and sitting and thinking. I'm not doing any action. Is it karma? Why is it karma? You are free to answer. If you say it is karma, then why is it karma? Okay, let's explore. I feel anger towards somebody. Is it karma? I don't abuse them. I don't become violent. I feel anger. That's all. Is it karma? I mean, there's something innate, right? Something that we are... Uh... There are so many times that we are annoyed at somebody even without them doing anything. <laughs> So, okay. maybe just... so your anger, is it karma? That's the question. You are angry even if somebody has not done something. The question is, is it karma or not? Not really. Like, isn't it a conscious thing? Like, is it your emotional self talking? Like, You have to be a little louder. I mean, uh, 
is isn't it like your emotional self instead of i don't know putting into karma isn't it like you deciding so it's your emotional self okay so that is not karma you are saying basically it is not karma it is my emotional self okay so thinking also is not karma that way because it is my intellectual self right body mind intellect we'll come to this unknowingly we destroy many living beings is it my karma while walking talking breathing eating so many living beings are getting killed is it karma technically yes <laughs> technically yes okay so because like when animals you know a lion hunts it's its nature it's nothing to do with karma isn't it it's inherent nature so animals inherent nature it is so it is hunting but there it is consciously hunting the question here is that unknowingly we are destroying many somebody earlier said that the conscious action is karma this is unknowing that's the question right just by my being so many are getting killed my walking so many beings are getting destroyed so is it karma somebody was saying something yeah go ahead i mean i i think it adds up to your karma it adds up to karma okay let's see yes sir uh, hari om swami ji ha ha hari om swami ji yes please go ahead somebody said, hari om you want to share something more please go ahead Ah uh, yes, Swami Ji. I mean, um, I mean, we are free to guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, Swami Ji, I guess based on the uh, aspects that you have provided over here, if I am going to define karma, my version might be a conscious action that has been done in order to cause a certain kind of result or repercussion. So, based on that, will you say any of these are karma? based on your definition based on my definition i don't think so swami ji i don't think it fits in karma so if i sit and think there is no conscious repercussion of it so it's not karma so my thinking is what the conscious like... repercussion repercussion might be with the individual and it might not be extended to another entity or another being as such so it's all right no if if, if the question is your definition said about repercussion right whether it's individual yes, or other being so if it is no repercussion other being that means it's not karma it's only repercussion perhaps Swamiji, perhaps okay let's see i don't do anything but i instigate someone to do something is it my karma i tell yes, somebody I to, you know is. go and give a slap to that fellow is it my karma or that fellow's karma <laughs> it's, it's both both, like, yeah. both. wow wow In I, sleep, I, I kick my neighbor. The... Unknowingly, I kick my neighbor. I have a habit in sleep. Let us say, I kick. Is it my karma? <laughs> Think. So this has. Since some... it affects my neighbor. Sorry. If it affects my neighbor. I think it is karma. If it doesn't affect my neighbor, that guy is snoring away to glory. Then it's not karma. okay let's see these are different scenarios there can be many more other scenarios in life to understand karma but i have taken just a few of them see what the karma means if you see gurudev's chart bmi chart then we will come to this that what is action action is karma is any action done with the bmi body mind intellect with intention with doership that's the equation of karma obviously any action physically happening is not going to happen without an emotion or a thought and emotion or a thought by itself is called subtle karma sukshma karma it is because that only manifests in the gross world so if we 
don't consider thought as a karma, then physical karma is not possible at all. Every single thought which we think with intention, with doership is a karma. Every emotion also is a karma. And that subtle karma only prompts us to do gross karma. So in the BMI chart of Gurudev, we see that so clearly, right? That vasana manifests as in desire in the intellect, as thoughts and emotions in the mind, and then at the actions at the body level. And then the results we get at the external level and those further strengthen the vasana. So that cycle goes on. Now in this, what is important is that intention is very crucial. The quality of that karma is determined by the intention. A thief also pokes the knife in somebody's stomach and kills them. A doctor tries to operate somebody and then that person dies even in spite of the best efforts. A doctor will not be punished but a thief will be punished. A murderer will be punished. Why? Because the intention is to kill. There the intention is not to kill. So intention determines the quality of karma. Externally some karma may look very very great but internally if it is very uh, you know, with a done with a cunning intent, with or with a manipulative intent, or you know, to harm somebody, then that karma is a negative karma. Externally, it may look like any great karma. So, intention makes a very very big difference. Intention determines the quality of karma, and doership determines whether it's my karma or not. Any karma which is done without conscious sense of doership that I am doing it. It is not my karma. It will not be added to my karma. And there are many actions we do like that. Where the sense of doership is not there. And so they are not added to my karmic uh, bank, karmic bundle. <clears throat> so if we understand this much, karma is action done with body, mind, intellect, with intention, with doership. Now we'll come back to those questions. Now you tell me, based on that, can any movement be called karma? Based on the equation of karma? Then again, it comes to intention and uh, doership. So any movement cannot be called karma. If intention and doership is there, only then it is karma. If I sit and think, is it karma? Yes, Swamiji. Correct. So if I sit and think I may not make any movements, but it is karma. In fact, it is much more powerful karma than anything else. Ideas manifest because they are sustained. The thoughts are sustained and one gives that energy to the thoughts and they will manifest. So if you just sit and do nothing but go on thinking one thought again and again and again and again, it will gather a lot of strength and it will manifest. Even simple thing like this session, we have been thinking you know, to do continuously for so many days and then it has manifested or not. So, thinking is karma. If I feel anger towards someone, is it karma? Yes. It is it's karma. Comedy. It will affect me first. Then if I manage to express it and uh, you know... <clears throat> I don't have control over it, then it will affect others also. But it will affect me definitely. So it is karma. It will affect me. The repercussion will happen on me. And if that situation is like that, then it may affect the others also. In daily life, we unknowingly destroy many living organisms. Is it added to my karma? Uh, no, Swami. No, Swami. Why not? Because it's not intention. Because uh, it doesn't have an intention. Correct. So there is no intention and there is no doership also. The one is not doing it consciously to destroy. If consciously one is killing an animal and uh, whatever, consuming it or doing it for some uh, you know, sport or revelry or something, then of course that adds to the karma. I don't do anything but instigate someone to do. Is it my karma? Yes. Yes, because I yes, right. and I instigated somebody. So it is karma. In sleep, I kick my neighbor. Is it karma? No, no because I didn't intend to do it. Correct. I didn't intend to do it. It is not my karma. So, once we understand this, how does law of karma work? Karma is action, which is a cause. Karma phala is the result, which is called the effect. 
So our entire life is an expression of karma only. <clears throat> we are alive because of karma. As long as karma is there to be exhausted, that is called prarabdha, which many of you may know or we will learn as we go along. Till the prarabdha karma is there, this body will be alive. When the prarabdha is over, the body will be dead. We are born because of karma. We live because of karma. We die because of karma. So karma is cause and effect. It is definitely applicable to everybody universally. Many people ask, Swamiji, what about those who are not Hindus? Does karma affect them? 100%. He's like asking, what about those people who are not scientists? Does gravity affect them? Are, whether you know it or not, gravity will affect you go on to the 10th floor and jump. You are not a scientist. What will happen to you? No, no, but I don't believe in gravity. You will still go up. But first you will go down. <laughs> you will crash. Whether you believe or not, it doesn't apply. These are laws of the universe. You call it karma or you call it cause and effect. does not matter. You give any name to it, but it will work. And now people are calling it also karma. Karma, they keep saying. So it's not that only Hindus it will affect. It will affect everybody. This is law of cause and effect. Simple. So now, once we understand this is karma, there are a few laws which we made just to understand this karma properly. And then we can clear our confusions and doubts if we have. So first law is action is anything done with a sense of doership through the body, mind, intellect to get happiness. To get happiness or to get freedom from sorrow, but freedom from sorrow is also to become happy only finally. So, this is the definition of action that we saw. Now, the first law says every action will produce result. There is no action which will not produce a result. Even science says or not, what is that law? Third law of Newton, I think. Right? Action will have equal and opposite reaction. Yes, one. So, every action will produce a karma phala. Karma cannot go without producing karma phala. That's the law, first law of karma. Just because the result did not come now does not mean it will not come. So if you apply law number one, every action will produce a result. So good karma does not cancel bad karma. A good karma will give good result, bad karma will give bad result. This net banking system does not work. 100 rupees you have credit and 40 rupees you have debit. So the net balance is 60 rupees credit. Some 100 good karmas you do, 40 bad karmas you do. So you have to experience the result of 60 good karmas. No, 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 no. The law is what? All 140 karmas you have to go through. 100 good and 40 bad. All of their karma follows one has to face. So when we apply this law of karma, from the unicellular organism, to the first human birth, nature evolves us by instinct. Self-awareness as we have today in a human being because we have the buddhi is not there in the earlier other yonis. So what happens? By the push of nature over millions of years, the evolution will happen. So whatever, the fish will become, the amphibian will become the reptile and it will go on. Slowly it will happen. 84 lakh species, it is said in our scriptures, the jiva will go through to come to the first human birth. Having come to the first human birth, one has got the buddhi. Whereby one has high level of self-awareness, one can make choices. But many times because we have come from the lower realms where instinct and survival of the fittest is the law, so there is a lot of insecurity because otherwise you'll be finished, you'll be extinguished, I mean, extinct, killed. So one has to fend for oneself, one has to look out for oneself. So there is a lot of self-preservation instinct over millions of years. So when one comes to human body also, there is great level of insecurity or you know there is the self-preservation instinct. So ego is strong and one doesn't realize the choices that one has and uh, sattvic choices, one doesn't know many things. So many animalistic tendencies carry forward. And so in many, many lives, we have done so many karmas. Not every karma we have done has given result. That entire bank of karma, 
which has not given the result, but which will give result. It's not that it, we will not get the result. We will get the result at some point. That entire bank of karma is called what? Sanchit karma. Total bank of karma. Which has not given me result. If I do karma now, I get result now. That is over. Finished. If I do karma now, I am not getting the result now. That will get added to my Sanchit karma. So that is my total karma bank. Now that's total karma bank. Sanchit, Achi, Chinoti means to collect. So total banks of karmas which have not given result, that becomes the cause of new birth. Whichever karma, let us say my total karma bank has 10 lakh karmas. If out of that 1 lakh karma is ready to give result, then what will happen? To exhaust that 1 lakh karma, whichever body I need, maybe animal body, plant body, human body, devata's body, whichever body I need, I will come to that. The cause for rebirth is this total bank. And so unless the Sanchit karma is not destroyed, one will continue to have rebirth. That one has to remember. The cycle of karma will not end because there is a total bank waiting. So this is law number one. Then law number two is results are nothing but action in another form. And hence, very important it is that focus on the action, the result will take care of itself. We don't have to worry about the result if our action is done with the best intention, with the best skill, with best application. It's not enough only to have good intent. It's very important also to have the proper application and smartness and efficiency in execution. Intent may be very good, but uh, action also has to be smart and intelligent. There are some people who have good intent, but uh, no proper execution. So there will, there will be inefficiency. So they don't get the proper success. Then one worries, I'm such a good person. I don't have any bad intention. I'm doing my best, but still why this is happening to me? Because intention and action both are very crucial. So this is the reason behind, this is the law behind what the Gita says, Karmanye Vajika Raste Ma Phaleshu Kadachana. That your eligibility, Adhikara word there means eligibility. Adhikara does not mean right there. Karmanye Vajikara Raste, your eligibility is only to do karma because as human being I can do karma. Consciously I can choose. My intention, my doership, everything I can choose. So, ma phaleshu kadachana. I don't have any eligibility to control the result. If I do the best action, I will get the best result, whatever is possible. So, focus more on the action, results will take care of themselves. If you read Gurudev's commentary on this, it is very beautiful in the second chapter where he says that. Uh, Action is done in the present, result comes in the future. So worrying about future, I spoil my present action, then how will the result come? I may expect an action result and I have to work hard to get that result in the present. I can't be anxious for the result. Gurudev calls that in the third chapter when he speaks about it also, he says this is called economics of thought. People are concerned about economics of money and all that. He says, this is economics of thought. If you conserve thought energy, conserve the inspiration and apply the whole thing in action properly, results will take care. Don't be anxious for the result. Will I get the right percentage or not? What if I don't get? Will I get the admission in that institute or not? And if I don't get, then what will happen to my life? What will people say? So many things we go on worrying. What does the law of karma say? Results are nothing but action in another form. Pot is nothing but mud in another form. Your performance is what will give you the marks. So marks are nothing but your performance in another form. So if one focuses more on the karma, that's it. And today, so many people are doing that. You see one of the very simple and nice clips of Mahendra Singh Dhoni. Yes.
only suggestion or advice would be, which I keep saying in all the interviews that I give, uh, process is more important than the result. The result is a byproduct of the process. But in today's world, we are so much focused about the result that we get away from the process. So take care of the process, you know, take care of all the small things and eventually you'll get the desired result. You know, we always keep complaining, oh, we should have gotten, gotten more and all of that. But it's actually the byproduct of what we have done. So if you prepare well, if we execute well, and you know, if you're honest to ourselves, more often than not, we'll get the desired result. If there's a shortcoming, it's always a learning. It's all the best. Simple, nice clip. One of the reasons why he is called Captain Cool. Focus on the action and results will take care of themselves. So that's the second law. Now, third law, results are governed by time and cosmic laws. As we saw, every action does not give result immediately. Results will come in time. Gurudev used to give this nice example of there is a field in which you sow different types of seeds, some mango seed and then the coconut and the tomato and the karela. You see, so all of them in different places, you give them appropriate manure, sunlight, water, you protect them from the whatever the animals around. Will all of them give fruit at the same time? Each one's fructification period will be different. Same way in the field of life, when different karmas we are doing, every karma will not give result at the same time. Some karma will give result now, some will give after some time, some will give after a few years, some will give after a few lives also. But it will come because the first law says every action has to produce a result. When that result comes, that we don't know. Who knows that? That Ishwara only knows. In time, the result will come and the results are also governed by the cosmic laws. So what are these cosmic laws? So see, time is what we already saw. Cosmic laws are external laws like gravity, action, motion, electricity, uh, whatever, whatever, what's that, electromagnetism, all that. External laws are so many. Internal laws are values and ethics. The moment we do something good, we feel good about it. When we do something wrong, we will feel the guilt, we may accept it or not, we may run away from it. But the internal compass is there. And so, based on the internal laws, external laws, various jivas, karmas, Ishwara will do all that, that when the result has to be given, Bhagwan's role is that. He is the cosmic intelligence who made the cosmic laws. Action will give a result. Based on what? Cosmic laws. That's why in the Gita, Bhagavan says, Samoham sarva bhuteshu name dveshyosti napriyaha. There is nobody who is dear to me and nobody whom I hate. I am equal to all beings. Why? Because I am the karma faladata. Oh, Swamiji, then why should I pray to Bhagavan? I thought I, if I pray, then you know, he will push my file little further and I will get the promotion quickly. And you know, we go to the Ganesh ji every time before the exam and then we say, Ganesh ji, please, please, you know, you do something and my paper, may I pass this with flying colors, then I'll give you one coconut. What? Bribe also, if we have to give, we're giving one coconut. You take a coconut and go and give to some government official or to some private, uh, you know, official, they will accept your coconut or what? Anyway, Bhagwan is kind. He doesn't mind at all. And I'm not saying you should go and bribe anybody. All I'm saying is that... Uh, we may think that our prayer is not useful then. If Bhagavan is same to all, then what is the point of my prayer? Please understand, prayer also is karma only. And you are invoking divine grace. You are opening up yourself. So that karma will have karma follow or not. Special karma will bring special karma follow also. It will invoke divine grace. If the window in my room is closed, I open it, the sunlight will come inside. The sunlight is everywhere. I have closed my room. So I am not getting it. If I open it, it will come inside. Bhagwan's grace is everywhere, equally available to all. Many people close the doors, so it is not available. You open the window through prayer, through tuning, through surrender, it will flow in. So Bhagwan is not partial. It is based on our karma, we get the results. 
एंड भगवान दैट्स वाई इज कॉल्ड कर्म फल दाता कर्म अध्यक्ष एंड कर्म फल दाता वन हु गिव्स अस द एबिलिटी टू एक्ट थिंक फील एंड हैज गिवन अस द चॉइस एज अ ह्यूमन बीइंग एंड देन एज पर द लॉज ऑफ कर्म भगवान गिव्स द रिजल्ट सो गुरुदेव इज टू से वेरी नाइसली दैट गॉड इज द कॉन्ट्रैक्टर executing the blueprint given by the architect that is you just imagine god is our contractor we are the architect but many of us don't know we are the architect we think that god is up there and so gurudev used to say that god has better things to do than write dirty lines on your forehead he did not create us to fail he gave us the choice and he gave us the knowledge and he gave us the opportunities and it is up to us how we utilize even the most difficult life of somebody is to exhaust their karma if they have been going through lot of challenges problems difficulties they sometimes don't have basic necessities but they are getting exhausting they are getting some karma phala and they are exhausting it also we find that so many people who are born in such difficult situations have lot of problems in life they have such high level of resilience and they achieve such great things and they set such fantastic examples and standards for people to follow so as far as karma is concerned the freedom bhagwan has given to the jeeva who is a human being bhagwan plays the role of a karma adhyaksha karma phala data so it is up to us how we choose to act so time and cosmic laws both are managed by bhagwan when to give the result to a jeeva because you think about it our karma is not independent our karma is entwined with so many people's karmas so if it has to come at the time when we want there will be so much of chaos in the world there will not be any results at all think about it two ipl teams are playing the finals both of them want to win <laughs> what result will come if we have to decide the results on that particular day whichever is the best team that is playing that team will win full stop now whatever will happen so bhagwan ensure that the jeevas come together and their karmas get exhausted and that's why at the right time one gets the results so in bhakti shastra we say that whatever results come are prasad of bhagwan we should accept it hum- with humility so now if you apply this law number 3 what is that law number 3 that time and cosmic laws govern the result so out of that total bunch of sanchit karma when some karmas are ready to give result those karmas are called my prarabdha or destiny so destiny is not something written by god destiny is our own past karma which bhagwan has uh ensured that the person gets the karma phala so fructification of whatever karma happens that happened by god's uh, will then that person gets the karma phala to exhaust it that person has to take a body whichever body is required for it not necessary human body so this is prarabdha prarabdha means what has already begun it cannot be stopped so out of that 10 lakh if 1 lakh is my prarabdha that decides my birth my place my people where i will be born everything and it will decide my life span and the time of death also when that one lakh karma gets over whatever be the condition of that body that body will die that body will drop dead so destiny is our own past actions it is not predetermined by god and hence what happens here we have chosen our environment our parents our relationships our place of birth success work everything is our choice yesterday's choice is today's destiny so we can't blame anybody we can't say swami ji you know i was born in india that's why i am stuck you know i am not very successful if i was born in america i tell you by now i would have beaten warren buffet bill gates everybody i would have been number 1 in the world but unfortunately you know i am born here now what to do you can't blame whoever is born wherever is because of their own karma they have chosen it i can't blame my parents i can't blame my 
environment i can't blame the country i can blame nobody how i will face what i am going through today that is my choice but why i am going through something i can't say swami ji i am unhappy because you know my neighbor very terrible fellow my spouse doesn't understand me my mother in law goes on fighting with me my boss does not give me promotion you know i am unhappy because of all that we can't blame anybody and gurudev used to say that in india we have one excuse that nobody else in the world has that why are you not successful why are you unhappy uh, because you know that shani is not in the right position so right from that saturn to my neighbor to my spouse to everybody is responsible for my sorrow except me once we learn vedant we understand law of karma we can blame nobody we can only take charge of our life so karma is not a pessimistic view it is to take responsibility of our lives and our actions and so what should be done we should study what are these cosmic laws study the vedas study the scriptures and understand oh these are the laws in the universe this is how it functions these are the laws governing the internal personality if i understand all this i can fine tune i can align well i can work then the results also will come appropriately without knowledge of many of the somehow we are living life by trial and error or just looking at everybody doing it so i am also doing it that doesn't work so we have the free will this intellect is what is given to us so in self unfoldment gurudev gives this very nice example of this log of wood which has a motor a boat so if the river is flowing at the speed of 10 kilometers per hour if the boat is in the river and it is flowing down with the speed of the river it will be flowing at 10 kilometers per hour if the boat has to stay then it has to put the motor has to work 10 kilometers per hour to maintain its place otherwise it will keep going down if it has to go upstream if it goes at 12 kilometers per hour speed then it will go upstream by 2 kilometers per hour slow only it will go upstream so our buddhi is like that where we have to put efforts to go against the flow of our thought process because some thought patterns we cultivated in the past now they are there suppose forget past life in this life itself i cultivated some negative thought patterns or some laziness now over a period of some one year i have cultivated let us say or simple very very simple things like watching television and eating food now every time i eat food i need to see something now if that habit has been formed now i have to go against that i say nothing doing i will finish out of three meals a day one meal i will definitely do without seeing the tv and i have to push myself to do it at that time the impulse will come no no come on watch it you know that particular episode of that particular netflix series is so amazing uh, you can't just stop there so just go and watch it are that push is there that impulse is there but one has to resist it so through right thinking and action i can nullify the effects of my past whatever may be my prarabdha in the present moment i have that choice that will create a different future and so if the present is the product of the past then the future is the product of the present we are influenced by the past we are not controlled by the past we should remember that however strong the past may be it may appear to us that we are controlled by the past that we have no choice and we are helpless victims it is not like that we are appearing helpless right now because of yesterday's choices so many times we have chosen the same thing repeatedly now it has become a pattern it has become a compulsion to us now i have to fight it out then i can change my future so when we say fate versus free will gurudev said what we meet in life is fate how we meet it is our free will and this is the greatest uh boon we say or the advantage we say of the human life and in fact if you go to see there is nothing called fate think why why is there nothing called fate 
because it's because it's faith is a manifestation of your previous grievance. The thing that is happening is a result of what we have done before. Perfect, wonderful. Yesterday's free will is today's fate. Today's free will will be tomorrow's fate. So where the hell is fate separately? And how many people they look at so many things and get confused and say, "I am destined to be like this only." I don't think there will be any love in my life. All the relationship in my life are jinxed only. I think I am going to be lonely forever. And they go into drugs, into depression. Arey Baba, use your buddhi and do purushartha. Don't get carried away by some stupid notions. Live life by proper understanding of loss and how it is working. So what if so many didn't work out? There are hundreds and millions of more possibilities. Something will work out, and be happy if it doesn't work out. There is so many more other things you can do. There are enough people who are having relationships and they are suffering. So either ways you can be happy. If you have it, you are happy. If you don't have it, also be happy. Why are you struggling? No, no, Swami Ji. Everybody is having somebody or the other to go with them on prom night or whatever, whatever rose day. They are they, having somebody to give them a rose. There is nobody to give me a rose. All chota chota things people keep crying for. But a human being, what potential one has, what all one can do in life, but one is stuck in some wrong notions. So there is nothing called fate. The Bhagwan is not sitting up there and writing some things for you. So don't cry. Why me? Why me? So fate is a creature of free will. Will never be more powerful than free will. That's the that's the strength that law of karma should bring in our life. Look at so many people's lives. What all disadvantages they have, and still they manage to achieve so many great things. You know, I keep showing this video to a lot of people. I'm going to share it again here. I'm not sure if you have seen this. Um, Yeah. Can't is not part of your vocabulary. If you just put your mind to it, you can do it. And you believe that? Yeah. That, that's the crazy thing is if you're never given limits, then you think, I can do anything. And if she could do anything, she wanted it to be this. What she saw her hero, Dominique Mociano, doing on TV. There was just one problem. Jennifer was born without legs, a devastating birth defect that had led her natural parents to abandon her the day she was born. It bothered me to think that there was a little girl that was left at the hospital and she had no legs, so I thought she needed a family that would love her and take care of her. Sharon and her husband Gerald brought her home to the tiny town of Hardinville, Illinois. Population 50, they say, if you count the dogs and cats. They decided to raise her like they raised their three healthy sons, with no limitations and just one simple rule. Never say the word. Can't. You said, I want to be a tumbler. <laughs> you didn't have legs. Right. You kind of need those, most people think, to, to tumble. <laughs> well, think again. The girl who wasn't allowed to say can't was on her way to becoming a genuine gymnastics champion. She started at seven on the trampoline with her dad. Oh. And after a few falls, she got the hang of it. In time, she was competing. And soon after that, she was dominating. And by high school, Jennifer Bricker, are you ready for this? Was the tumbling champion of the state of Illinois. Soon, Jennifer was pursuing other sports too. Even one, you'd figure she had absolutely no chance to play well. Until it turned out, she could steal the ball even grab a few rebounds. And she could make baskets, too. She didn't consider herself handicapped. She was talking to some friends one time, and uh, one of them said something about her being handicapped. She said, well, I'm not handicapped. And they said, well, you have to use a wheelchair. She said, just to keep them getting dirty. <laughs>
One day at age 16, out of curiosity, Jennifer asked her mother a question. Hey, is there anything that you, like, know about my adoption or biological family that you didn't tell me? I said, okay, but you gotta sit down. And she said, Mom, I'm always sitting. <laughs> And she said, maybe you should sit down. I said, okay, let me sit down. And she said, well, what's the big deal? Just tell me what my last name is. And I said, well, that's the big deal. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, your last name would have been Mochianu. I knew what that meant. I knew that Dominique Mochianu was my biological sister. When she finally tracked Dominique down, Jennifer wrote her a letter. Inside the envelope were adoption papers, a photograph, and a stunning piece of news. My biological last name is Mochianu. That, that line, I, I was just like, I can't believe this is happening. Everything was there. The evidence was there. Jennifer looked like the spitting image of my youngest sister, Christina. What a moment to, for anyone to even speak to their childhood idol, but for their childhood idol to be their sister, that's something. She told me she was an athlete in the letter. In fact, I was her inspiration to start tumbling and doing gymnastics. And then on the phone call, she goes, oh, by the way, I have no legs. I mean, she's like, wait a minute, didn't you just tell me that you're an acrobat and you did all these sports and I could just hear the wheels turning, and, you know? Yeah. And I said, who is this girl? Oh my gosh. How did she have this attitude to persevere in life and overcome every obstacle? And she's my sister. Jennifer has moved out to Hollywood. Where else if you want to be a star? She drives a specially equipped car and lives a normal, independent life. And she's earning a living. How else? As a gymnast. She's an acrobat who has toured with Britney Spears. And now she's training for a classical performance at New York's Lincoln Center. We got to go to Ohio and got to watch her perform. The audience just went crazy. They stood up and they were whistling and screaming and clapping and, and all this. And I was blubbering. <laughs> I was sobbing because it was so beautiful. And it's like, oh my goodness, that's my baby. The baby who was taught early on never to say the word can't. Hmm. So you see, how prarabdha can be anything, but with Purushartha, what one can achieve? She could have cried and, you know, blamed fate and victimized herself, saying, you know, I'm a victim of life and this is not good. My parents have abandoned me. I don't have legs. How will I become a gymnast? Nothing. And her childhood idol happens to be her sister. So many examples like that. Dr. Ahili, I mean, uh, Rani Ahilya by Holkar. 28 family members of hers died one by one in front of her. So much sorrow in her life, but we remember her as a great woman of so much of strength who established, rebuilt and uh, revived so many of our temples, whether it's Somna, Jagannath Puri, Kashi, Rameshwaram, so many places across the country. Dr. Abdul Kalam was born as a fisherman's family, a very humble family with 12 siblings went on to become the people's president, missile man of India. So how we use our free will is a very, very important aspect that one should uh, remember. So the law of karma need not be a law which can make us uh, feel completely dejected. Actually, it is a very empowering law. So this is about the law of karma the application of the third law. So I read somewhere very nicely, destiny is not in the lines of your palm, but in the grasp of your hands. How do I grasp my present moment? If I'm not able to achieve some result that I want, and I'm working hard towards it, we may feel you know, the fate is putting a lot of obstacles and why this is happening. And it is because of some past karmas, that the present is not working out at the moment. If I continue to put that effort, it will happen. It is not that uh, it will not happen. <clears throat> so, suppose there is a nail with which uh, you have fixed a nail in the wall. Very strongly and deeply the nail has been fixed. Now, if you want to pull that out, 
with what force it has gone in, we have to pull na, with that much force and more than that. Plus whatever, you know, the wall has become rigid over a period of time, so many other factors. If we say, you know, no, the wall is putting obstacle, I don't think I can pull it out. No, you have to put more force, that's all it is. So obstacles only indicate lack of adequate free will or enough self-effort. Put in more efforts and overcome the obstacles, it will happen. So three laws we saw so far, action, every action will produce a result. Results are governed by time and cosmic laws. And result is nothing but action in another form. Now, fourth law, doer of the action is the experiencer of the result. Nobody can escape karma phala. Even if the result has not come now, it will definitely come going by the first law. So if we think that, you know, good actions we have done, yet we are suffering, bad actions people are doing, still they are prospering, why this is happening? That is because sometimes their good karmas are giving results right now. And some negative karma of ours are giving results right now. So it appears like that. But it is not that good karmas will not give result. It will. So in because we are facing the results of the past, in future we have to face the result of our present actions. right? So nobody can escape. <clears throat> When we realize this, that I only have to go through, we will follow morality, ethics by an internal motivation. Not because other people are following, so I do. If they don't follow, why should I follow? You know, Ratnaka transformed into Valmiki when he realized this. When he asked his family that, will you bear the sins with me, which I'm incurring because of all this looting, plundering? They said, no, we will not. And he realized that, oh God, I have to face all this by myself, then why am I even doing all this? And so he changed. And he told Naraji that, please tell me a way by which I can transform myself. He did not tell Naraji that, Naraji, let's strike a deal. Whatever I'm earning, 15% of that I will give to you as CSR. Government stipulation is only 2%. I will give you 15%. <laughs> no, he said, I need to transform myself because negative karma when it comes, the karma follow when it comes, I have to deal with it. Why will I incur it then? And so, karma will empower me. So, doer is the experiencer of the result. Fifth law is every karma will produce two results, visible and invisible result. So, visible result is what we experience at the body, mind, intellect level. So suppose you drink a coffee, first time you have taken coffee. Then the pleasure is at the body level, you feel so good or you may not like it. If somebody lovingly has given it to you, you feel very happy. And if it has been your great desire to go and have some particular type of coffee and you feel elated, all that is at the body, mind, intellect level. But there's an invisible result that is called a vasana. Now that vasana will prompt, next time I want to feel relaxed, my vasana will say, go drink a coffee. Because that was my first experience. If I don't like it, then my vasana will say, no, no, don't, I don't need of a coffee, we'll go to something else. So every karma will give this visible and invisible result. And that is why, what will happen, while we are enjoying our present karma, when it is done with the intention of selfishness or I, me and mine, it will create new karmas. And those karmas which don't give such results immediately, they are called agami karma, they will get added to the sanchit karma. So every karma is the seed for new karmas. So these impressions will create desires, thoughts, action, results. So vasana manifests as desires, thoughts, actions and those actions will give results and results are temporary, they will further strengthen the vasana. So these are called, these are added to my sanchit karma, total bundle. And hence, what happens? Every karma produces this cycle. This is what will happen. So there is no way to come out of this. How do I come out of this? If karma is going to create all this, each karma is a seed for more and more and more and more karmas. The last law is the sixth law. That is the key to come out of this cycle. 
and that law says motive of the action determines the merit of the action how i act with what intention i act that will determine the merit of the action and if i act with selflessness and if i surrender my doership then that karma will not bind which is what karma yoga is so selfish motive will strengthen the ego and keep us in the bondage of karma selfless motive will completely liberate me so motive determines whether the action is good or bad failure and disappointments don't meet bad karma or that we are being punished it is some result of some karma which i had done in the past now that is coming to me so i am not getting certain results it's all right i can keep putting my effort so maximum growth also happens because of those failures and how we face it our intention makes the maximum difference because success can make us complacent sometimes but failures can make us think more okay, why did i fail what wrong did i do what could i have done better it will make us think figure out alternatives improve our performances you know fill up the loopholes and gaps in our efficiency so that way if we apply this sixth law selfless motive will reduce the ego and egocentric desires they will purify the mind and if i dedicate actions to bhagwan saying that bhagwan i am a nimitta you are only the karta then this cycle of invisible result now which is getting produced that will break there karta bhav will break intention will be purified mind will become quieter and slowly the karmic pressure will come down and that person can be liberated from the bondage of karma now this much these are six laws of karma that we have understood now based on this if you have any questions you want to ask anything share anything you are welcome i hope some foundation has been laid clearly uh swami ji i have a lot of questions i am so sorry yes please go ahead you ask one by one Hari Om Swami Ji. Uh, first of all, Swami Ji, huge fan from the conviction itself. Uh, really like your teaching style and the way you speak. And Swami Ji, uh, my doubt was particularly regarding uh, even in the convention. I wanted to ask you this, but I think I couldn't. And you just said that the karma also did, like when you think of something, karma adds up, right? So like particularly, I'm a very big overthinker. Like I try efforts to stop it and try to control myself, but there are some certain moments in life where you start overthinking and it leads to a very big downfall. So how to save? Uh, how to like? I know that there are many methods to control it, but in in some de desperate times, it just is uncontrollable and just flows. So how to make sure that you're as you said the reverse thing? How to make sure that uh, we still flow in the upstream and not uh, get into it? so see when we say that every th thought is a karma the karma will give result so we also know that thought produces enough uh, impact on our body and hormones and many such things happen so when we do overthinking also it will have a effect on the body but it is also necessary to understand here that uh, overthinking in terms of when we are anxious and many thoughts come those thoughts are not sustained by us they don't have that much of energy if they are sustained thoughts which keep coming you know overthinking the same pattern of thoughts if it keeps coming now that one has to be alert about because that will manifest in some form or the other in action but otherwise the thoughts come and they go sometimes we are anxious and then those anxieties create certain challenges now but they won't manifest after that because they just go they are passing thoughts they come and they keep going so it depends on what is the way of overthinking that uh, one is engaging in and like you said many methods are there you are aware of but uh, i would say more important is where a person has more confidence in oneself faith in oneself that whatever comes i will be able to deal with it and secondly takes um has an emotional anchor where one can be feeling secure and safe and uh, loved and happy then this overthinking will not happen and third takes 
the help of logic to start thinking possibilities based on reasoning, not based on assumptions. That way there are methods which are available, but the spiritual knowledge and the strength is what one has to use and not uh, worry about the karmic consequences. If there are negative thought patterns which are very strong, that I have to work to break. And I need to invoke faith. I need to have a positive goal. I need to work on my strengths. Those things I can do to counter that negative strong thought pattern. Otherwise, if it's just random thoughts coming and going, don't bother. It will not create anything difficult. Thank you so much. Uh, Hariyam Swamiji. Yes, Hariyam. Uh, Swamiji, my first question is, will our karma or our actions affect the people around us? Definitely, first question for me. depending on whatever your karmic relationships are and connections are with the people, it will affect them in different ways. And also what is their level of uh, Purushartha that they are putting, they may not get affected by it also because they have a certain level of strength also. So we can't say everybody who will get affected in what way, that is not possible, but people will get affected because as we saw in the beginning, this whole thing is an interplay of karma. If you are born to some parents, that's because their karma is there with you and your karma is there with them. So you have come together to exhaust that karma. So your karma will affect them, their karma will affect you. So it is definitely possible, but how much it will affect whom? That depends on many factors, depends on karma, that depends on each one's mindset, but it will affect, there is no doubt. Even uh, I, Swamiji, I, my uh, next question is... Like, yeah, go ahead. Okay, Swamiji. Swamiji, next question is, it's. I mean, I've been, this has been conflicting me. I mean, I'm, I'm just giving you a case study, like not a case study, just an incident that I could think of. Suppose if I am uh, having a poultry farm, and uh, I have, of course, my intention over there is to keep poultry for butchering. I sell it to the butcher. That is how I earn my money. The butcher kills it, kills the uh, whatever poultry it is and gives it to the consumer. So how is karma disposed over here or who is right and who is wrong over here? So one simple fact is that Bhagavatam also says, our culture everywhere, it says, Jeevo Jeevasya Jeevanam, life subsists on life. So we don't have a choice. For us to live, there has to be a life which has to be used. But the choice is in using a life which is of the least evol evolved form, where a plant you don't have to destroy completely. You can yes, do many vegetables, etc., where the plant lives. You don't have to destroy completely. Some will get destroyed, some no need to destroy. So one has to make like that intelligent choices. Plants don't have that many senses developed as a as an animal has. So if one knows that very clearly, then if one is able to choose, one should choose to do a different profession. One. Because karma will affect. The animal is being raised and then the butcher is butchering and the consumer is eating, karma will affect all of them. There is no doubt. Because where choices are available, if you are not making the choice and then life's, uh, some life, higher forms of life are getting destroyed where lower forms could have been used, then the karmic consequences will come and that jiva's karma with you will have to be settled. At some point, it will, ha it will happen. One can't uh, stop that. Even um, uh, what we call that's called collective karma, you see. So even sometimes people go through certain things together because they did certain things in that karma, they were together and uh, it will affect. So wherever possible, one has to change that. Also, it applies to the certain uh, attitude. So when Suppose somebody says that, no, I'm this, this poultry I'm raising, I'm only selling it to the butcher. If the butcher kills, then that is not my lookout. But your attitude, you know, okay, the butcher is going to kill. So you are not killed directly, yes, but Swamiji. the animal is getting killed. 
and now the yes, says that no i am killing because the consumer wants to eat so basically the everything is because of the consumer so it has to go to the consumer all karma has to go to the consumer it will not work like that at every step whoever is involved to whatever extent you have ensured you have facilitated that karma of that consumer no so each one will get the karma to whatever degree their intention and their uh, attitude is based on that the karma will come and so the shastra says try to move away from himsa as much as one can and take up minimum himsa absolute himsa at physical level is not possible take up minimum himsa and uh, that requires that sensitivity and clarity otherwise one says no no i, I don't believe in all this then it will not uh, help the karma will catch up at some point in time and when it catches up then one wonders what wrong did i do why did this happen are many things were chap which one has done in the past that time one didn't bother about it now life is bringing it back when we are butchering certain animals at that time for the pleasure of this 2 inches of the tongue we eat but when yes. life brings one massive accident and let us say those three people are uh, you know going through a certain terrible accident at that time one wonders why this happened to them then that time life is butchering at that time one is not uh, you know wondering that one is not thinking about what one has done in the past but life keeps a track so karma will come back at some point on the other and which is why one should be very alert wherever possible one should make wise choices which are minimum himsa choices ஸ்வாமிஜிஸ்வாமிஜிஸ்வாமிஜிஸ்வாமிஜிஸ்வாமிஜிஸ்வாமிஜிஸ்வாமிஜிஸ்வாமிஜிஸ்வாமிஜி
till a person doesn't realize the limitation of karma becomes dispassionate and attain self knowledge this cycle will go on so it is applicable whether i know it or not whether i believe it or not the jiva will go through it the jiva may not go through it in the same way as it is personified that's a different matter that's a way of communication but the states of consciousness they exist there is no doubt and there are enough people who have come back to say those people who give this argument you know, who came back from heaven to say it exists so nobody came back so there is nothing called heaven and nothing called hell a place there are enough near death experiences which have people have gone through who have been declared dead and the dr raymond moody he did the whole research on more than 2000 people who were clinically declared dead many of them had no spiritual background with many of them were atheists many of them were so called scientists and logicians and all that and he has written a book also life after life and there's a movie also life after life read all that and one will understand that so many of them have said what is exactly given in our puranas they will say that you will go through this there is an astral body from where you can see the physical body also and then you cross that astral plane and you go through a tunnel and then you come to the light at the end of the tunnel and then your whole life is reflected in front of you and then you feel the presence of a divine consciousness where you feel absolutely loved and accepted you feel so happy and then when you have to come back into this body for whatever reasons it is excruciating pain the state out of body was so good state inside the body is absolutely painful so many things they will explain we somehow come under you know become apologetic about our culture and we try to hide it up saying no no this is all not scientific let us confirm only to science but what is science anything that is only visible is science there is such a huge universe which is invisible and science cannot deal with it can you so will you go to a doctor and ask the doctor that you know this uh, particular bridge which is there in my city that the bridge has a lot of cracks which have developed can you please set that bridge right what will the doctor tell you you say you go to an engineer now are you coming to me will you go to engineer and say that you know i had loose motions last time last night i went four times what will the engineer tell you he can't explain that how can you use science as a means to prove things which are beyond senses it is not possible is there life after death is there a soul which exists where one will understand all this what what is the nature of the infinite consciousness one doesn't know science doesn't know so if we say no i am very scientific i am scientific okay you be scientific but don't apply science in religion especially in vedant you can use logic to a certain extent and vedanta has its proper logic of the shastra that's why shankaracharya ji says shruti mata starko nu sandhiyatam go by the logic given in the scripture you don't apply scientific logic to spiritual books just like you can't apply you know scientific logic to art will you apply scientific logic to art then none of the poetry will work chand sa roshan chehra what chand roshan chehra chand sa chand does not have any roshni only it is borrowed light and chand has all dhabba that means your face has dhabba now now if you go by science your entire poetry will be destroyed finished it will be so you don't apply science logic in art na in painting in poetry in um, creativity then why are you applying scientific logic here and thinking that only what is visible tangible universe is existing this is only gross level of universe there are so many subtle levels which are there which is why shraddha is required in the shastra and what shastra says the principle has to be understood thoroughly and that will give us the direction properly ki okay if this is what they are saying this is what happens then how is it that i should live my life now we have to go by that we can't go only by what uh, is popularly believed you know hari om swami ji yes now uh, how is time affecting karma like you want to do a karma so intentionally with good intentions but then we won't have sufficient time to either execute it or then we'll uh, give excuse saying 
I don't have enough time to do the right karma. Now the time is over. So it depends on your intensity with which you want to get that. Okay. If you really want it, you will find time to do it or not. If I don't have that much intensity and then I want to give some excuses, you know, now time is up. I don't think it can be done. So that is one possibility. That intensity is not enough. That conviction is not there ki why this goal is important. Second possibility is a functional possibility. Suppose we say that, you know, I'm just giving a random example that suppose you want to get into, uh, let us say, IPS. Now, you can't apply beyond a certain age to IPS. Now, that's over. Now, there's a functional limitation there. You tried, let us say, four times and that age barrier you have come to and you can't apply anymore. Then one says, you know, now it is not possible. So, I have to go for plan B and figure out something else. There it's a functional matter. But otherwise, it is the intensity which is very important. And I should ask myself that question. How badly do I need this? If I know that I need this and there is no solution there, there is no choice there, I have to do it, then I have to buck up myself and with whatever time available, best time available, put the maximum effort and do it. There one should not give excuses. Just adding on to this, uh, Swamiji, like if I, if I want to do good, then again, won't it be like you're adding more good karma to your this thing? Unless it is done with a sense of non-doership. Like uh, if you're going to, and this was also going to be my question, like to get rid of all the Sanjita karmas that you have, the only way it is possible is, as you said, like, like good karma or bad karma, like the karma itself should uh, be zero, right? Like at the level of zero, then only then... Uh, it can be exhaust. Like you don't uh, incur more karma or get more karma or develop more karma. So good karma is also very important in some in in ways because the good karmas will give punya as a result. The punya is what gives us good health, wealth, family, plus satsang, intelligence, ability to apply what we know. All that comes because of Punya Karma. Even good sleep comes because of Punya Karma. So, to a large extent, doing good karmas is very important to avoid the negative karma as well as to give us the uh, good experience of life. When I understand even the limitation of good karma, that is when one will rise to realize the truth. One will seek knowledge. There the priority will become knowledge. So, from negative karma or being indifferent to karma, being lazy, one comes to good karma. And from good karma, one goes to seek knowledge. The priority will change. And when one starts pursuing knowledge, then one says that whatever karma I am doing, I am doing it at the feet of the Lord as a dedicated instrument of the Lord. I am not the karta because however good karma it is, it is like a golden chain and a copper chain. Both are chains. But a golden chain in this context is still better. Because that will help me to liberate faster. It will be an aid in liberation. That copper chain is thick and very strong. It will pull me back. It will keep me bound in samsa. This golden chain will help me. I can finally, it's thin. So I can pull away from it and I will be free. So good karmas also are required. So one should not stop doing punya karmas and good karmas. But do it with the dedication to the Lord then one will come out of karmic bondage. Uh, do we have any more questions by anybody? I think we're all... I don't know if uh, Swami, we're holding Swamiji uh, for a very long time. Finish another one or two if they are there, then we'll conclude. Uh, Swamiji, I have questions. Swamiji. Yeah, please. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, Swamiji. Swamiji, and one another question is I come from Kerala, Swamiji, specifically from a place called Kannur. So in Kannur, we have a traditional worship of uh, local deities or uh, this thing, Kula Devatas and Grama Devatas over there. So over there, we do sacrifices. So how is that going to be with respect to 
karma like we do sacrifice of hen and goat and etc so the devata see this comes in tantric practices the devata yes, demands a certain bali to get pleased and then the devata will bless that jiva with whatever that desire of that jiva is so in that the bali is being given so that will generate a certain amount, amount of negative karma there is no doubt the blessing of the devata also one is getting so that same karma is going to produce both positive and negative in some way or the other if the person chooses again it comes to choice here if one wants to choose some other forms of devatas and worship where bali is not required then that is your choice or if one says no i am willing to pay the price for it i want this particular benefit this is my whatever kula devata or whatever is the devi or devata and they demand this so they will also bear the consequences of it there is no doubt one so this is one way to understand so law of karma will work it will affect both the offerer as well as the consumer right so the devata also will is a jiva finally so that jiva also will incur some karma this person is offering also will incur karma and the blessing of this devata also will be there which can help this particular uh, person who has done the offering this is one way to understand so one can make satvik choices there are other people who will say ki nothing happens that devata sanugraha will take care of everything we don't have to worry and no negative karma will also come because the devata wants we are offering otherwise we don't need to offer we don't want to offer by ourselves it is entirely for the devata alone and the devata is a entity who is much beyond the uh, you know cycles of creation of human uh, of the earth also the life on this earth is very short and so devatas go through they are phenomenal forces and they see destruction in mass and some of them are even in charge of destruction aspects so it doesn't make a difference for them you offer the bali you please the devata and the devata will bless you and you forget everything else so that's another view so it depends on which one one wants to follow uh, i can't say which is the right or which alone is right because tantra has a certain belief system law of karma in vedanta has a certain belief system and we don't need to choose which is right and which is wrong uh, basic point very simple it is karma is choice karma phala is consequences now you choose and figure out if you are ready to deal with whatever consequences which we may not we may not even know which are specific consequences but if you have shraddha in the devata then don't worry about it the anugraha of the devata will take care of it uh swami ji one more thing uh when we talk about karma isn't it also highly subjective to the person of what that person thinks is right or wrong or what that person's mind might think is right or wrong i'm i'm sorry if i am no it um, is not like that alone it, but... there is no doubt that karma as we saw that intention motive of the action determines the merit of the action right but yes swami ji we also saw the law earlier which says that time uh, results are governed by time and cosmic laws so there are cosmic laws so universal values are there that you don't want anybody to kill you to harm you to hurt you to cheat you to loot you to plunder you then you have to do that to others no there one can't say that you know the thief thought that in his mind it is right to come and uh, loot me so it is right and i think it is wrong so it is my perspective this is my truth that is their truth we can't say that then there is no need of law there is no need of justice there is no need of court there is no need of policeman each one can do what they feel like right so while there is a intention that is important there is no doubt but universal values will govern what is right and wrong no <clears throat> and so from the universal value standpoint if you don't want animals to kill you why will you go and kill animals is a simple no so if we understand that very clearly then keeping in line with universal values and my intention i have to align which is what dharma tells us there is a samanya dharma and there is a swadharma 
that samanya dharma is all the universal values which everybody is expected to follow and my swadharma i have to align with the samanya dharma both these have to come together we can't say only one so my intention has to be pure positive good and it should align with the universal values so some people say my intention in killing this chicken is very good because you know if i don't kill the chicken the population of chicken will increase in the world so i am trying to save the world from the overpopulation of these fishes and the chicken and all that so i am eating them that is stupidity who gave you the responsibility of controlling population of chicken and fish in the world did anybody give you that nature will take care no that fish and the chicken has the right to live live as you have the right to live so that is universal dharma your intention may be good but it is not aligning with the universal dharma no so you have to match both is what law of karma will say that match both the intentions the universal values and your thought process has to align properly yes swami ji swami ji i have a lot of questions but constraint of time so i will keep it uh, as it as it is right okay some other time no problem basic yes, principles swami. of karma we have discussed on based on that you can think more and you may arrive also at many answers by yourself and if not at some other time so i generally conduct a q and a session once in a month last two three months have been very hectic so i have not done but uh, september onwards it will happen so that time the information will come out on the social media what date and what time generally it's on sundays at 3 o'clock one sunday in a month so you can log in at that time and follow i mean ask the questions sure swami Okay, thank you, everyone. I hope your questions on karma and confusions have got cleared a little bit. It was nice to have this satsang with all of you. Wish you all the best in the study that you are doing of the texts, and uh, may the knowledge of the scriptures give us the right direction, clarity, purity, and dexterity, and may you achieve all success and happiness. Thank you, Hari Om. Hari Om Sir. Thank you, Swami Ji. This was excellent. Uh, remembering uh, Star Wars, uh, may the scripts be with you instead of may the force <laughs> be with you. So <laughs> I uh, wish that for everybody. So this was an extremely uh, engaging session. I am uh, extremely thankful for you to take some time. I know how difficult it has been for you with all the uh, production work and the camps and everything. I am. Uh, extremely thankful again so i think we can finish this i will just uh, quickly chant the shanti part so we'll finish so om purnamada purnamitam purnat purnamudachyate पूर्णमादाय ओम शांति 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 सर्वे भवन्तु सुखिनः सर्वे सुखिनरामे भद्रा पश्य कचि दुख भाग भवे शांति 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 हरि ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओम हरि ओम स्वामी जी हरि ओम एवरीवन थैंक यू